is Deborah Tavares with StopTheCrime.net, your co-host today on today's program. Um, I want to talk to you further about the Genocide Treaty. This is imperative, and it's built and based upon the fundamental understanding that we do not have a government. We need to all understand that we are in a warfare called attrition, the action or process of gradually reducing the strength and effectiveness of someone or something through sustained attacks or pressure. That's what we are all confronting now with the weaponized weather assaults all over the world. And we are going to get into more of that after I continue with the Genocide Treaty. So the Genocide Treaty allows for a government to kill an entire race of people. Only a government, when its troops invade other nations, can attempt to destroy an entire race outside of its borders. Only a nation can blot out a race. On December 11th of 1946, the United Nations General Assembly voted unanimously to declare genocide as a crime under international law. And nearly a year later, on December 9th of 1947, the same assembly unanimously adopted what is known as the Genocide Treaty. Because of the obvious omissions and inherent dangers in that treaty, the United, Nation, United States did not ratify that treaty for decades afterwards. And finally, 40 years later, under immense political pressure from various sources, the United States approved it on February 9th of 1988. And nearly eight months later, on October 14th of 1988, the Senate gave final approval to the treaty as they enacted certain legislation which would impose extremely heavy penalties to those found guilty of violating the treaty. The Genocide Treaty is also called the Genocide Convention, and it was signed by President Reagan on November 11th. And on December 9th, 1988, the treaty was ratified by the United States of America and became an important law of the land. When it was formally filed by the representative of the United States President at the United Nations headquarters in Lake Success, New York, in an official ceremony before all the delegates of the General Assembly Hall, the document was handed to the Secretary General of the United Nations. Therefore, the United States approved the Genocide Treaty on October 14th of 1988. It's now on the statute books of 96 different nations on the planet. The Genocide Treaty has become the first worldwide man-made plan in the history of mankind. Here is a definition of genocide. The deliberate and methodical annihilation of a national or racial group. The systematic killing of a whole group of people in a nation. Genocide means the physical dismemberment and liquidation of people on large scales, an attempt by those who rule to achieve the total elimination of a subject of people. The treaty defined definition differs substantially from that in the dictionaries, however, and it's important to understand that it includes such terms as mental harm by members of a group or moving people from place to place and to different places continuously or even birth control. So here I want to add something. The weaponized weather assaults globally on all of us is causing mass relocation of people who are not able to return to their homes. And I'm going to talk about that in a bit on how this is affecting Northern California in Sonoma County because it is absolutely horrific what we see going on here that is all part of the displacement and the disconnect of our families. It's shattering our unity, and we must stay together. So continuing on with the Genocide Treaty, itself has such a vague wording that leading American uh, 
attorneys have declared it to be dangerous. The Genocide Convention, or Genocide Treaty, is such a vague and dangerous treaty that to cure its imperfections would require changes so substantial that they would have to be regarded as amendments requiring renegotiation of the convention by the United States and United Nations itself. And this is per Charles Rice, professor of law, as quoted in the congressional record February 13th, of 1986, Senate Bill 1288. It goes on, many of its terms are shrouded in uncertainty, says Senator Strom Thurmond of North Carolina. And there was a Senate debate on October 10th of 1984 in the congressional record. And it is important to know this is a, the Genocide Treaty is a statute which forbids or requires the doing of an act in terms so vague that man of common intelligence must necessarily guess at its meaning and, and differ as to its application. This violates the first essential due process of law. And this is uh, its effect on our legal system in the American Bar Journal of 1949. It has been challenged and queried for decades. And again, the United States held out from becoming a member for 40 years. The Genocide Treaty, also known as the Genocide Convention, threatens U.S. constitutional sovereignty. Again, this is where it's important to understand we don't have constitutional sovereignty. Again, because the United Nations Constitution declares that intentional treaties made by America take precedence above and are more important than the in internal laws of a nation. I'm going to repeat that. The Genocide Treaty is more important than any internal laws of any nation. This is a global Genocide Treaty. It ran afoul of con con conservative objective objections that it threatened U.S. sovereignty and constitutional objections. And this was written in the Washington Post, February the 20th of 1986 on page A27. Again, we're going to post this treaty so you'll see it. No treaty signed by the United States government has ever been found unconstitutional by its Supreme Court or any lower court for that matter. I'm going to add this. We do not have a judiciary system that serves us. It is all part of the corporate arrangement to help further the genocide treaty and all of the ills that are besetting all of us globally. So it goes on to tell us that genocide is being carried on by political groups and political governments all around the world. And for 37 years plus, the Convention Treaty met with considerable opposition. They go on to say that various opponents were concerned that the Convention would supersede the U.S. Constitution. Well, it has. We don't have a constitution in effect. That's what I'm telling you now. They go on to say acts against political groups were not made criminal offenses. The convention would be enforced in ways detrimental to the U.S., said the Bureau of Public Affairs, Department of State, in June of 1986. Going on to say, the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics signed the Genocide Treaty on December 16th of 1949. The Soviet Union regularly imprisons Christians in Russia and its satellite countries. This treaty was quickly signed by the very nations that are practicing genocide on a day-to-day -day basis. They signed it because its wording could not include their own governments. So you need to understand, under the illusion that people believe that their own government is set up for them and that they have a government that's running them, as we had been led to believe in all the schools across the United States that we have a representative government, I can't underscore enough that our voting is our agreement to furthering this hoax on, on the American people. When we vote, we are under the illusion that our votes matter. 
we have actors in place in political um, levels that appear to look like a functioning government, and of course it's not. The treaty was quickly signed by the very nations that are practicing genocide on a day-to-day basis. Again, a list of the signatures of the genocide treaty reveals that it includes the leading practitioners of post-World War II genocide, and those that have signed this are from Albania, Bulgaria, Red China, Cuba, Czechoslovakia, Vietnam, and the Soviet Union, and more. No American citizen or resident alien, legal or otherwise, is excluded from the sweep of this article in this treaty. As for the enumerated crimes, killing of the group does not allow for any legal defense. This is why there is no admission to the chemtrailing and all the poisons and toxins and and viruses that are being spread on us. This is why there is no um, recourse for the vaccination program. I want to add at this point that it's important to understand with the 5G network coming in that dormant viruses that we have been vaccinated with, or at least those that have chosen to be vaccinated with, will be activated by frequencies. We're going to see many illnesses globally from the vaccination programs. But the Genocide Treaty goes on to say that causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of a group um, is, is, is okay. It's okay. And they say that it's not the specific degree of mental harm distinguish whether the injury includes psychological disorientation, um, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, can lead to charges raised by minority groups suffering from residential discrimination or ghetto life. The list of possibilities for creative lawyers is practically endless. And this is out of Friedlander. Um, on pages 268 through 269. They go on to tell us that domestic laws, laws governing our own people, have not been described by foreign powers. In this treaty, governments outside the United States are reshaping the regulations governing our own U.S. citizens. Stopthecrime.net. I have been talking about the genocide treaty that the United States signed in 1988, and I want everybody to uh, hear the conclusion of this treaty. Uh, domestic laws, laws governing our own people in the United States, have been decided on by foreign powers. In this treaty, governments outside the United States are reshaping the statutory rules and regulations governing all U.S. citizens. For the first time in our nation's history, a treaty has been used to invade an area of domestic law. Again, we do not have domestic law in the United States for the United States citizens. We are the enemy. According to Senate Report 93549, these are my words, and this are my research. But again, in the treaty, for the first time in the United Nations history, a treaty has been used to invade area of domestic law. We are letting foreigners make our laws for us. The laws that will decide which of our people will be imprisoned and for what crimes. Again, although the commonly called genocide treaty, technically it is a convention and not a treaty. A treaty is a bilateral agreement between two nations. A convention is a multilateral agreement between many nations, in this case, most of those on the planet. So I'm going to go into why our environment is weaponized and what is happening with 
the depopulation plans. And of course, we've been told uh, in many articles through the years, the Georgia Guidestones and more, but I'm going to read just a couple to you now that were told to us by Dr. Henry Kissinger, the former U.S. Secretary of State. He says, depopulation should be the highest priority of foreign policy towards the third world because the U.S. economy will require increasing amounts of minerals from abroad, especially from less developed countries. I want to add one thing. Rothschild and Rockefeller are targeting the United States. This is their mission for 2018, their plan to restructure North America through the resilient policies that we're seeing unfold rapidly in Northern California. And I'm going to speak to that on other radio shows and cover it solely. But I will tell you what Rockefeller is saying. Whatever the price of the Chinese Revolution, 78 million dead, it was obviously succeeded. It, it has obviously succeeded in producing a more efficient and dedicated administration, but also in fostering high moral and community purpose. The social experiment under Chairman Mao's leadership is one of the most important and successful in human history. This is for David Rockefeller, banker and honorary director of the Council of Foreign Relations, honorary chairman of the Bilderberg Group, and founder of the Trilateral Commission, and member of Bohemian Grove. Bohemian Grove is here in Northern California. We see the private jets fly in every year when they meet, and they are conducting and creating genocide programs. We're going to talk about the many ways in which genocide is occurring and some of the solutions. This is most important. This information is absolutely not intended to scare you. I know it's scary, but by knowing this information, we can choose solutions that will help fend off these assaults as best possible. So I want to continue on with what we have been told over and over again, that the world population needs to be reduced by 50%. The elderly are useless eaters, and that is Henry Kissinger. And advanced forms of biological warfare that can target specific genotypes may transform biological warfare from the world of terror into a politically useful tool. This is Dick Cheney and Paul Wolfovich, the project for a new American century, rebuilding America's defenses. So when we hear words like sustainable or UN Agenda 21 or rebuilding America's defenses, we need to understand they're building the takeover of all global populations. This is exactly what is happening. The quickest way, they say, to reduce the population is through famine, like in Africa, or through diseases, like the Black Death. And that is from Thomas Ferguson, U.S. State Department, Office of Population Affairs. And we're going to continue with this conversation on the other side of the break. discussion prior to the break. It's important to understand what we have been told time and time again, and this comes out of Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars on page 11. They tell us that since energy is the key to all activity on the face of the planet, it follows that in order to attain a monopoly of energy, raw materials, goods, and services, and to establish a world system of slave labor, it is necessary to have a first strike capability in the field of economics. They go on to tell us that in order to maintain our position, they're talking about the elites, Rothschild, Rockefeller, the military, etc. In order for them to maintain their position, it is necessary that they have absolute first knowledge 
of the science of control over all economic factors and the first experience at engineering the world economy. In order to achieve such a sovereignty for them, they must at least achieve this one end, that the public will not make either the logical or mathematical connection between economics and the other energy sciences or learn to apply such knowledge. And they're allowing us to know this, and this is important. They're telling us that it will only be a matter of time before the new breed of private programmer economists will catch on to the far-reaching implications of the work that begun at Harvard in 1948. The speed with which they can communicate their warning to the public will largely depend upon how effective they have been at controlling the media, subverting our education, and keeping the public distracted with matters of no real importance. I want to read from a newspaper that my husband and I um, picked up when we were in Russia uh, this year, uh, well, actually in 2017. This paper is, um, is interesting because it's the same game that's being played here in the United States. And uh, this is uh, May uh, is saying and accusing the EU of election interference. And May is the U.K. Prime Minister, Theresa May. She speaks at Downing Street after visiting Queen Elizabeth to receive formal assent to hold a general election in June. Again, the headline says, that she accuses the EU of election interference. This is a game that's being played everywhere. You're hearing all of this infighting between um, election interference and in the United States right now. This is a game. This is a distraction. It is intended to distract us all and keep us psychologically programmed into the idea that we have a government at all. So I want to continue on what is important about the energy discovery that Rothschild made back in 1954 when this uh, silent weapons system began. And again, this is a warfare of attrition to wear all of us down psychologically, emotionally, and with our bodies. This is all part of a genocide treaty. Silent weapons for quiet wars is a continuation and a disclosure of genocide. And what Rothschild discovered was the basic principle of power, influence, and control over people as applied to economics. That principle is when you assume the appearance of power, people soon give it to you. He goes on to say that he discovered that currency or deposit loan accounts had required appearance of power that could be used to induce people with inductance which people corresponding to a magnet field into surrounding their real wealth in exchange for a promise of greater wealth instead of real compensation. We're seeing this happening with all of our debt loans. and This is going to be covered with what Rothschild says next. They would put up real collateral in exchange for a loan of promissory notes. He found that he could issue more notes than he had been backing for, so long as he had someone's stock of gold as a persuader to show his customers. He loaned his promissory notes to individuals and to governments. These would create overconfidence. Look at our stock market right now. I'm adding this right now. Look at the overconfidence, because Rothschild is directing an intentional plan to restructure North America right now. I'm telling you this right now. I'm also going to throw in right now that in every single city, your mayors are going to sign an agreement for resilience implementing, for paying for the illusion of shock cities by each city will be required under a mayor's agreement to give 10% of their revenue annually every year to this resilient program that is coming in, that is backed by Rockefeller and Rothschild. Again, I will be giving more details on that because this is rolling over 
Sonoma County right now. But he goes on to tell us that he would make money scarce and tighten control of the system and collect the collateral through the obligation of contracts. The cycle was repeated again and again. These pressures could be used to ignite war. Then he would control the availability of currency to determine who would win the war. That government which agreed to give him control of its economic system got his support. Now remember, the United States signed on to, to the Genocide Treaty. We have an incorporated government structure. We have been working with this genocide program and the economic takedown. So have all the other nations on the globe. Collection of debts, he goes on to say, was guaranteed by economic aid to the enemy of the debtor. The profit derived from its economic methodology made Rothschild all the more able to expand his wealth. He found that the public agreed would allow currency to be printed by government in beyond the limits, which is inflation, of backing and precious metal or the prediction and production of goods and services. So again, this is in the Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars document on page 9. I recommend that you read that for yourself. You will hear me refer to a silent weapons system, biological warfare, economic system, and a takedown of the global um, human population under this intention. We're all being told. And I want to talk now about what we have discovered in the um, NASA war document. Again, that is on StopTheCrime.net. Uh, and what happened here in Northern California. I hope all of you by now have watched the YouTube that we have up called The Plan to Burn Up Northern California. It is the YouTube, The Plan to Burn Up Northern California. Again, that YouTube discloses the agreement uh, between the California Public Utility Commission and Pacific Gas and Electric, with, which is Rothschild, to use satellite lasers. And uh, we found these documents a few years ago, and um, it's important that everyone understand that this was a hit upon Northern California. I want to go on to just mention uh, we went to a recovery fire meeting in Santa Rosa yesterday, and what I found was absolutely horrific. Of course, not only do we have thousands of homes that have been lost. We have thousands upon thousands of displaced people, but we also have thousands of people who need restoration to their homes because they were near and adjacent to the burn sites. And last night was a presentation. It was rather diabolical because what we learned is that many of these homes are so toxic that they really uh, cannot be lived in unless the um, insulation on the interior of the walls is removed because of the fine ash particles. Uh, unless their carpets are removed and their padding, oftentimes subfloors need to be removed. Uh, in Northern California, the predominant exterior um, material application is wood siding, and it is penetrable, and uh, many vinyl windows uh, melted that were near the burn areas. Um, also, even if the home survived, the initial appearance of survivability, uh, their electronics are compromised because of the fine dust particles, the coils on the refrigerators. All of the electronics that are built in clean rooms have been compromised. This is a horrific reality for those survivors that believe they've survived. They're literally being returned into their toxic homes by the insurance agents and agencies because the insurance is all run by Rothschild and Rockefeller and the, and the bankers. I want to say some additional things right now because this is going to apply globally. Certainly any place on this planet that is being hit by weather weapons, and I have not seen any place that we have visited, Russia included, and South America that is not being hit by weather weapons. This is a global assault. And what I want to say right now is uh, in Northern California, insurance companies are dropping many policies, insurance policies, for people in the fire zones. Here is why they're dropping them. And we're going to talk about that more. I, I hear a break coming up. I want to cover this. This is vital. This will affect all of you globally, all of you. Welcome 
back. I was talking about the insurance policies here in Northern California. You're going to see this in other parts of the country as well. But they're dropping insurance policies because they are designing new models of scoring home insurance in hard-hit areas. They're also developing the uh, exclusion of policies if there are dead trees. Now, we know that the intentional killing of our forests with the overhead aerial spraying has, of course, increased dead trees throughout the globe. And that's why it's important to understand the plan to burn up Northern California. There are two plans, not only the disclosed PG&E documents between the California Public Utility Commission and the intention to use satellite-based laser weapons, but the second part of that plan that is part of that YouTube uh, discloses how they are killing the trees in Humboldt County, Mendocino County, and in northern Sonoma County. This plan has not yet occurred, but it's imperative to understand that the Fisher family that is out of San Francisco that owns Old Navy and the Gap and handles and controls a lot of government decisions has been killing millions of trees on a lumber, in Pacific lumber that they purchased a number of years ago by a slash and squirt method of poisoning the trees. This is fully backed with um, the um, Board of Supervisors in Mendocino County with fire chief letters pleading that they require these trees to be removed, and they're not. The Fisher family's attorney only offered evacuation routes for people that are in the gorgeous coastal communities of Mendocino County. So again, they're dropping policies due to the dead trees that they're creating, and they're dropping policies because of climate change. Climate change, which they are creating with the global artificial weather control. So this is now going to become uh, more of a uh, a um, fabricated market that they're building on top of. They have us all believing in all the policies that uh, fossil fuel, it, we're running out and now we have got to go to electric. They're just tightening up our inability and they're literally encapsulating us in these resilient cities for a diabolical increase of frequencies. I also at this point would like to point out there's an excellent YouTube up from a firefighting company uh, in their response to the Santa Rosa fires. It's on YouTube. It's called Firefighter Perspective, Tubbs, T-U-B-B-S, Fire Santa Rosa. I would ask that you all take a look at this. When they were sent up here to help us with the fire out of Berkeley, which is only uh, an hour south of Santa Rosa, they were told it were, was a grass fire. In talking to a, a fire uh, battalion chief just last night at the fire meeting, I asked him to explain his experience of these fires. He said in his entire 30 years serving as a firefighter, he has never seen anything like this. Garage doors were blown to the top of 40 and 60 foot trees. Uh, other household items were blown into the sides of the fire trucks. He said it looked like a wa water flowing, but it was fire. It was ash and soot. And he had never seen anything like that. He said he felt hopeless and powerless. They could not stop it and he had never seen anything like this ever before. We went on to ask him what happened on Fountain Grove. That's the area above the Hilton Hotel that you may have all heard burned. They were gorgeous um, million-dollar homes and up. There were, the fire hydrants were not operative. When the beginnings of the fire started on the evening of October 8th of 2017, much of the communication went down. Uh, the firefighting um, uh, were really limited and disabled because of the burning of cell phone towers. A lot of the cell phones were not operative. The emergency response system uh, was taken down in many instances. People were getting Nexels, which were wireless alerts in areas of approaching fires, but those that were burning were not getting any information at all. 
it is utterly amazing that there was not a larger loss of life. To date, about 44 people lost their lives in this intentional hit by these directed energy weapons. But there are plans for Northern California as a result of these weapons, and there are plans in your city, wherever you've been hit, by weaponized weather events as well. And we're going to go over that again on a later show because I want to go over more of what is happening here in Santa Rosa, uh, Northern California. It's, it's important to understand that all of the homeowners still must pay their mortgages, must pay their property taxes. They are being prorated based on when the fires burn down their homes, but they also must pay for their insurance. If their insurance cancels, it is likely they will not be able to get new coverage. So what we see happening now, and I will keep you posted on this, is what they're planning for those areas. They're excluding people on those areas. They're highly toxic to begin with, but without the ability for people to have insurance, their property values will slide. They're there will be people that will be able to pay for cash for rebuilding and potentially not have to have coverage, not advised, of course. But uh, the lawsuit that the attorneys are putting together now against Pacific Gas and Electric is for recovery of lost property values because of the lack and ability to get insurance. But I must tell you this. Pacific Gas and Electric, Southern California Edison, in fact, most of the utility companies that I've had a chance to look at throughout the country are changing their billing cycle on our smart grid. And what they're doing is they're going to start charging us at time of use. This is how they're going to extrapolate more money from all of us so that we pay for all of the costs that they're being sued and accused of doing. The at-time-of-use billing is literally charging us when we're using our utilities the most, when we get home from work. So from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., they're going to charge more money for the use of electricity. They also are planning to disallow the credits that people have had from solar production on their own homes. This is all being planned now. It's going to be effective in April of 2018. We are being set up to pay for our own demise, as we have been doing all along. And this is Rothschild. The utilities, thousands of different utilities across the country now have the smart meters deployed up on them. Also understand that the smart meters we know were part of what occurred here with the fires. They were blowing up and certainly adding to the explosions and flames in the homes that went up here. We will never find that out because the um, the um, forestry that is in charge of determining the cause of the fire is, has all signed on to the idea of UN Agenda 21 policies. I want to leave you all with this. UN Agenda 21 policies are genocide policies. I want to stop calling it UN Agenda 21. We need to call it as it is because UN Agenda 21 tells us there are too many people using too much stuff, and that's genocide. And that's what we face with these policies rolling into all of our incorporated cities and counties across the United States. 